dealt quite a lot with uh, the theory for the growth of precipitates. And we can work out the growth rate depending on whether it's diffusion controlled, interface controlled, uh, solid trapping, or a mixture of all three. And we've looked at the evolution of shapes of precipitates. And today, I really want to deal with uh, overall transformation kinetics. That means how the volume fraction changes as a function of temperature and time. And of course, we might have many, many different precipitates growing at the same time, interfering with each other, uh, and new precipitates nucleating all the time. We need some theory to tell us the volume fraction as a function of temperature, time, and other parameters. We've already dealt with growth, and Professor Gray explained nucleation to you. Is that right? Okay. So can anybody explain why we need nucleation? Why can't the phase simply start growing once we go below the equilibrium temperature? Because it will go faster. Sorry? It will go faster. Mm, no. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is, say the equilibrium temperature is 300 degrees centigrade. Then if I go a very tiny uh, drop in temperature below 300, nothing will happen. You've got an energy barrier you need to overcome. Yeah. And why do we have that energy barrier? Because the... Yeah, this is, um, you need an um, energy change to overcome all those terms you've got up on the board, like yeah. and energy and stuff like that. Okay, so le let's imagine that we are forming uh, a spherical precipitate here. Yeah? Okay. Well, the first thing is that, of course, nothing will happen when we are above this transition temperature. <coughs> but when we go below the transition temperature, this phase gamma will tend to transform into alpha because there's a free energy reduction. Right? And that free energy reduction we call the chemical free energy change. And when we multiply it by the volume of that precipitate, that actually favors the formation of the precipitate. Okay? Because if, if I'm on this side of the transition temperature, there's a reduction in free energy. So this term is negative. It leads to a reduction in free energy. And this is simply the volume of the precipitate. Now, if this is forming in the solid state and it has a different density, then it will cause strain. So we have volume multiplied by the strain energy per unit volume. And this term will be absent if this is precipitating in a fluid, because a fluid can flow to relieve any strain energy. Okay? So this term I'm not emphasizing. You also create a surface around the precipitate, which is a defect because the atoms don't know whether they belong to the precipitate or to the matrix. And that is a positive energy per unit area. So we multiply it by the surface area of that precipitate, and that is the thing which means that you will not immediately get transformation when you cool below the equilibrium temperature. You will have to overcome a barrier which is caused by this interfacial energy. And that is the meaning of nucleation. We wouldn't need to worry about nucleation if the interface energy was zero, because you could start transformation instantaneously as you go below the equilibrium temperature. Okay. So the most important thing about nucleation is that there will be an interfacial energy which opposes the formation of a new phase, and that interfacial energy will be a very large component of this equation when the particle is small. Do you know why? Why is that most important when the particle is small? Yeah, if you think about it, if I have a small particle, the amount of surface per unit volume is large, and as the particle grows, the amount of surface per unit volume becomes negligible. So when the particle, when r, which is the radius of this particle, is very small, this term dominates everything, okay? because r squared is much bigger than r cubed. Right, so let's just think about this. Uh, if I take this equation, uh, it's really written over here. I've said to you that there will be a barrier to nucleation. So the free energy will at first increase, even though we are below the transition temperature, and then decrease. So 
your graph of free energy will look something like this. If I'm plotting the radius here, this is zero, and this is delta G, the change in free energy over here, then you will have to go through a positive free energy change because of that surface energy before it starts to reduce again. <coughs> now, in order to find this maximum and to identify the critical radius, which is the point where the free energy starts to decrease, okay, and the height of this barrier, which we'll call G star, how do I find the maximum? Well, I differentiate that equation with respect to radius and set it to zero to find the maximum. So if I differentiate 4 upon 3 pi r cubed delta G cam, I get 4 pi r squared delta G cam, and similarly for the strain energy term. And the differential of this with respect to r is simply 8 pi r sigma. Okay. Set that to zero, and therefore I find the critical value of the radius r, r star, which depends on the interfacial energy and the chemical and strain energy terms. And in this equation, um, if sigma here, the interfacial energy per unit area, is zero, then R star is also zero. In other words, you don't need to have nucleation. You can start, uh, you can get a negative free energy change from size zero. It's only interfacial energy which causes this increase in the total free energy change until the critical value of the radius is reached. Everybody happy with that? Okay, so that's R star. Now if I take R star, which is the critical size of the nucleus, and I substitute it into this equation, then I get the value of G star, the barrier to nucleation. So here, this is the equation for R star. If I take R star and I substitute it into this equation, that gives me the activation energy for nucleation, G star. This height over here. And notice that it varies with the cube of the surface energy per unit area and the square of the chemical free energy change. So this is a very, very important term in determining the height of that barrier, the activation barrier. Okay. Now, we've got this material which is trying to nucleate, so it's nucleating by fluctuations. So if you're observing the atoms, then just by pure chance, by thermal vibrations, it will adopt the structure of alpha temporarily in a small region. And if that structure has a size scale which is greater than R star, then the free energy will start to decrease and the nucleation process will be successful. Okay, so we're looking at random fluctuations uh, giving rise to nucleation. So, can anybody tell me what is the probability of a successful nucleation event? Probability of a successful nucleation event. So, we've got this system with fluctuations and the fluctuations are trying to go beyond our star. Some of them will succeed, some of them will decay because they've got to this R star and then they decay. So, any ideas? What is the probability of a successful nucleation event? a small one. Right, but um, in terms of getting over this barrier, how would I express that mathematically? Oh, well, it's 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 yeah, it's just like it's the Boltzmann equation. Uh, so, we will have exponential minus G star upon KT where K is Boltzmann's constant. But that's the probability of a successful event. But we are ignoring one thing, and that is that if we've got this transfer of atoms across the boundary, you know, there's a different crystal structure on one side compared with the other side. So there's another activation barrier there, which is for the transfer of atoms across the boundary. And that's a constant value, minus Q upon KT. But this is the barrier for atoms to jump across the boundary. That is constant, but that depends on the driving force, the strain energy term, the temperature at which you are doing uh, the calculation, and so forth. So here you are. This is an illustration of the whole process. 
this is how the interfacial energy component of delta G varies with R star. Uh, sorry, this is how the interfacial energy component varies with G star. It is a positive change in free energy because an interface is a defect. This is how the chemical and strain energy terms contribute to delta G. And if you combine these two, you get a curve like this. But this is the activation barrier. This is the critical radius. And the nucleation rate, that means the number of particles per second per unit volume that we form, will have this probability term, which is the chance of getting over this barrier. And this is a constant term at a given temperature for the transfer of atoms across the boundary. This is an attempt frequency. You know, things are undergoing fluctuations. How many times per second is a fluctuation attempted? And if I multiply it by these two terms, then that gives me the chance of a successful nucleation event. This is the number density of sites at which fluctuations happen. So supposing that you can consider each atom as a site, then that would be like the number of atoms per unit volume. <coughs> so this equation tells us the nucleation rate per unit time per unit volume. So a question. The Q term, yeah. is that for transfer from the, the liquid to the, to the solid? To the solid. Yeah. Parent to the product. But presumably there's also the opposite process. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, so you have a barrier. So if we are nucleating solid from liquid, then this term here is the chemical free energy change, the G chemical. And this term here is the activation energy for forward change. So, this is a revision of nucleation theory. Are you happy with that? Right, so let's now think about volume fraction as a function of time and temperature. Uh, we've done growth theory, we've done nucleation theory. Somehow, we've got to combine the two. Now, Avrami did this theory, and I'm going to explain that to you in detail. It's a very beautiful theory, done almost 70 years ago. So imagine that we are observing this volume of parent phase and that we have two particles which are growing. Okay, so this is at a time t and then we are looking at the picture at a time t plus delta t. So in other words, a short time later. Uh, we, will, we might have nucleated two new particles here because we have a finite nucleation rate and these particles will have grown and the basic problem is that look this particle obviously cannot exist yeah why can't it exist because it is inside, it, it is inside the grown particle that's right it's in a region which has already transformed but mathematically i don't know how to tell the system that look don't form in this region form in untransformed phase Similarly, these, this, this kind of thing cannot happen because the particles cannot grow into each other. So the problem we are trying to address is how to deal with incorrect bits of material and therefore to work out the true volume fraction as a function of time and other parameters. Okay? So imagine that we are starting here and at time t we have two particles of alpha and a short time later, they have grown into this size. So the dark blue region represents the increment of fraction, and that we form these two new particles because we have a finite nucleation rate. The problem is how to eliminate this incorrect volume. Okay. So we will call, if I add up all these dark blue regions, I will get the incorrect change in volume fraction. And we identify that by writing that as EV with a subscript E. Now you can think of E as an error because if I add up the dark blue regions, I will get the wrong answer for the amount of new phase that I formed because this cannot happen. Okay? 
And what we've got to do is correct that into the real change in body infection. Abrami called this the extended, uh, this term, the extended volume. In other words, supposing we ignore the fact that uh, particles already exist and that we assume that particles can grow into each other, then it will give us an incorrect volume which we call the extended volume. So in all the textbooks, you'll find this being referred to as the extended volume, assuming that particles can grow into each other. Now, the brilliant thing that he did was he wrote down this equation, where this is the change in extended volume, adding up all the correct and the incorrect dark blue regions. And he said that, look, if I assume that the probability that this dark blue region falls into untransformed material is simply the volume fraction of untransformed material, which is this, 1 minus the amount of alpha phase we have divided by the total volume, then this is the probability that the dark blue region will fall in untransformed material. So if I multiply this by this, I get the true change in volume fraction. Okay. Now, is that clear to everyone? This is quite an important concept. Once we do that, you can treat lots of particles growing together. So is everybody happy with this concept? That in order to correct this in incorrect increment of volume, which has particles growing into each other, we simply multiply by the probability that any new transformation falls into this white region, which is the untransformed phase. Okay. So I multiply this by the probability of finding untransformed phase, then I get the true change in volume fraction. Okay. Now, of course, this assumes that particles are located randomly in space. Now, once we accept this equation, that to correct this term, we simply multiply by the chance of a dark blue region falling in untransformed material to get the correct volume. We can easily integrate this. And so this is the Avrami equation. If, when we integrate it, you see by taking this term onto this side, dV alpha divided by 1 minus the fraction of alpha. So we have dV alpha over 1 minus V alpha over V. And that's sort of like having dx over x, isn't it? Yeah. So when you integrate that, that gives you a logarithm. The yeah. integral of this will be logarithm of x, won't it? Yeah. And that's where this exponential term comes from, because when I unlog it, I get the exponential term. So here is the relationship between the true volume fraction of alpha this is the total volume, and this is the volume of alpha, so this is the volume fraction of alpha, is 1 minus exponential of the incorrect volume fraction of alpha divided by V. And the incorrect volume fraction is very easy to calculate. You just multiply the nucleation rate by the size of the particle. Yeah? So we've got the growth rate, so we can work out the size of the particle, and we've got the nucleation rate multiplied, ignoring any impingement between particles, that means particles growing through each other, and particles forming inside particles which already exist. So this part is very easy to calculate. Yeah. It doesn't take account of the fact that we have regions which have already transformed. And by using this equation, we can correct the volume fraction of alpha. Okay. So this is extremely important theory, which has been applied successfully for at least seven decades, and in all aspects of kinetics, not just in material science. Are you happy with the derivation? Yeah. Okay, so let's go on and do some examples of this. Uh, so imagine that we are observing the system rather like, uh, uh, like this. We are observing this system, and this particle obviously started to grow first. This particle started to grow later. And we'll assume that the growth rate is constant 
that means it, you know the length or, or dimension of the particle increases uh, at the same rate with time. Sorry. Uh, in some cases, it is valid uh, that the growth rate will be constant. For example, if it's interface control growth, then you know it will be linear with time. We will consider cases where it's parabolic with time. So, we're observing that system, and nothing happens until we get to a time tor 1, when this particle starts to grow, and then it continues growing as time evolves. Then we nucleate another particle here at time tor 2. It continues to grow at that rate, tor 3, tor 4. So all these particles are starting at different times. And the incubation time, that means before this particle nucleates, will be different for different particles. So tau, the definition of tau is that the particle doesn't exist before that time. Okay? So if I want to write the volume of the particle which has formed at time tau 1, and let's say that G is the growth rate, and let's assume that we have isot isotropic growth, that means the dimensions are the same in all directions, then how can I write the volume of a particle nucleated at time tau? So it's isotropic growth, so what will be the shape? Sphere. sphere. So what's the volume of a sphere? It's 4 upon 3 <coughs> pi, and r is the radius of the particle, but I want it in terms of growth rate and time. So, if growth rate is G, what will be the value of R? G multiplied by time. And what is the time? T minus T minus tau. And the whole thing cubed. Because the particle doesn't exist before this point is reached. Yeah, so you have to remove that much time from the total time which we are plotting along this axis. Okay, so that's the volume of one particle is started at the time tau. Yeah, here you are. The volume of a particle is started at a particular time tau. I could put a subscript here. Yeah. Being 4 upon 3 pi g cubed, where g is the growth rate, and we are assuming it's constant, T minus tau cubed, because G cubed times T minus tau cubed is R cubed. So this is just the volume of a single particle. Now of course we have a nucleation rate. So at any given time T, how many particles do I have? goes back to nucleation rate. If I multiply nucleation rate by a time increment, then I get the number of particles that are formed in that time increment. Because nucleation rate, you remember, has units of number per unit volume per unit time. So if I multiply the nucleation rate by an increment of time, then I know how many particles have started in that interval of time. Okay, so here we are. Uh, the incorrect change in the volume fraction of alpha, because we are ignoring infringement and the existence of transformed regions, is first of all, the volume of a particle which has nucleated at a time tau, okay, multiplied by the nucleation rate per unit volume, by the amount of volume that we have, and the increment of time, d tau. So between 
a time t and t plus d tau, that is the change in the volume of alpha. So in between the time t and t plus d tau, this is the incorrect or extended change in the volume of alpha. Yep. This is the volume of particles which are nucleated in uh, at a time tau. Nucleation rate per unit volume per unit time, the volume of our system, and the increment of time. Now I want to change that into the correct volume of alpha. So I just use the Avrami relationship here to do that and substitute for dV alpha extended and I get this simple equation here that the true increment in alpha will have this term multiplying all this. with that? Everything is solved, really. I actually have the true increment in the volume of the phase as a function of a change in time. And you can put all your growth theory into this equation. And the growth theory, remember, contains diffusion coefficients, contains information from the phase diagram. Yeah. Uh, you can put all your nucleation theory, that means the number density of nucleation sites, so, for example, if you are forming the product from a grain boundary of the parent phase, then you can put in the amount of surface per unit volume as the number density of nucleation sites. You have an activation barrier, which takes account of the chemical free energy change, that means thermodynamics, the strain energy term, and the interfacial energy term. Uh, and you, you have some information about the shape of the particle in there. In our case, we have assumed it's isotropic, but that assumption is not necessary. It could be growing at different rates in different directions. We simply replace G cube by G1 cube, G1, G2, G3. Okay. Where G1, G2, and G3 are growth rates in dif uh, different growth rates in different directions. So let's let's just integrate this. Okay. If I integrate this, I'll get the volume of the phase on this side and I'll get some function of time on this side. So just by looking at this equation, uh, what do you think will be the final exponent of time? You know, will it be t to the power of 3, t to the power of 4, or what? Yeah, we already have t cubed, don't we? Yeah. And we've got another integral. So with, with uh, these assumptions, I, I take this equation again. Uh, I take this term onto this side. So we have something like uh, dx over x. And I'm going to summarize the volume fraction by using this parameter here, Greek letter, psi. So this is what I get as dv alpha o 1 minus v alpha o v integrated, gives me mi minus log 1 minus i, is equal to this term which I've taken out of the integral because we've assumed that the growth rate is constant and that the nucleation rate is constant. Okay. So remember all these assumptions. Because I've taken this out of the integral, I'm not allowing the nucleation rate to vary as a function of time. So the assumptions are that we have a constant growth rate and a constant nucleation rate, and I need to integrate for tau changing from naught to any particular value of t. When I do that, I get this equation, that this is how the volume fraction of alpha will vary with the growth rate, the nucleation rate, and with time. And the exponent of 4 comes because the particle is growing in three dimensions. So we have g cubed times time cubed. And a further dimension coming because we have the nucleation rate times time. Now, supposing that we started with a case where we have a fixed number of particles, so we're only considering the growth of a fixed number of particles, what would the exponent of time be? In other words, we are not nucleating, we've simply placed tiny particles 
which are beyond the critical size, and they are going to grow. What would the time exponent be? Q, because the nucleation rate doesn't come into it. Okay. So, the point I'm trying to make is that by looking at parameters like the time exponent, you could in principle, get some information about the mechanism of transformation. You know, whether nucleation rate is playing a role or whether these, you know, you can assume that particles exist at time zero and they are going to grow. Now, the equation we have here, we have derived rigorously. We know exactly what's going into it. And it's a completely rigorous physical equation and therefore you can deduce information about the mechanism of growth. Okay. But many people use this equation completely empirically. In other words, they write it, put lump all these terms into what they call an Avrami constant, Ka, and a, an empirical time exponent, which is called an Avrami exponent, N. And then, of course, if I take uh, the logarithms of psi and plot against time, I can deduce empirically the values of k and n by fitting to experimental data. And that is okay if you simply want to communicate the results to somebody else. But it doesn't give you the insight which you get when you develop the equation rigorously in terms of nucleation rates and growth rates. So it's better to do it like this and get some physics out of your results than to use it completely empirically in this way. Uh, the shape of, of the, uh, a curve like this uh, will be sigmoidal. In other words, it starts off as a slow reaction because the particles are starting from a small size and therefore when they grow from a small size to a slightly bigger size, the increment in volume is not that much. And then you have a, a fast growth rate here, a fast evolution of volume fraction. And then you're running out of matrix phase. You're running out of the parent phase because you are transforming it. And therefore it levels out like this. Okay. So this is the classical sigmoidal shape of the Avrami curve. <laughs> Everyone happy with that? Now, just to give you a bit more detail, <laughs> You know, we've got differences here between 500 and 400 degrees centigrade. Well, first of all, it's faster in this case at 400 because you are at a greater undercooling, so delta G chem is larger. Okay. The chemical free energy change is larger. If I go back to... I can do all this remotely, but I haven't learned all the buttons. <laughs> so you can see here that if I go to a greater undercooling, then I have a bigger difference in free energy between the parent and the product phases. Yeah? So this term becomes more negative. Now. In this particular case, if I change the alloying element concentration, I actually retard the transformation because the free energy change decreases. I'm stabilizing the parent phase relative to the product phase by increasing manganese. That, that information, of course, comes from the thermodynamics that we did. So here we are consolidating thermodynamics, kinetics, diffusion coefficients, everything, to get an overall transformation rate. Uh, if you take this equation, or this equation, and you take the logarithm of minus the log of 1 minus psi versus logarithm of time, then you ought to get a straight line. And the slope of that line will give you the time exponent, and at some point the intercept will give you this term or this term. So if I take the logarithm of this, then logarithm of 1 minus psi is equal to minus pi g cubed iv t to the fourth divided by 3. Okay? 
Now, is this positive or negative? Mm, psi, psi is the volume fraction. And this is 1, because that's the maximum volume fraction. So it's the log of a number smaller than 1. So it will be negative. And that's why we have a, you can see we have a negative sign here. So if I take that negative sign here onto this side and take another logarithm of this, yeah, then I get that as log of pi g cubed iv. And this is, this is the constant term, uh, over 3. Effectively this term here. Yeah? Plus four, uh, four log t, okay. and this then is the Avrami exponent n. So by plotting this function here versus the logarithm of time, you should get a straight line. If you don't get a straight line, that means that something is changing during the course of transformation. Right now, what could be changing? Well, you could be running out of sites to nuclear particles on. You know, all your grain boundaries are completely depurated, then the nucleation rate will become zero at some stage. Yeah. Alternatively, the composition of your matrix might be changing because the precipitate has a different chemical composition to the matrix. So the reaction will slow down as the particle grows. The growth rate will slow down because the growth is parabolic. Yeah. Now supposing growth is parabolic with time, what do you expect the time exponent to be instead of 4? Okay. Supposing that the particle increases with t to the power of a half, increases a dimension with t to the power of half, instead of t. Okay. If the growth rate is constant, the dimension increases in proportion to time. If the growth rate is parabolic, then the dimension increases with t to the half. So what do I expect this exponent to be for parabolic growth? It's 4 by 2. So what, what did you say? 4 by 2 is because uh, t earlier dependence was with respect to t, now it is t half. Yeah, so you're almost two. right. I tell you why. The growth part will contribute 3 upon 2 because it's t to the half cubed, t to the power of half cubed, the particle is growing in three dimensions, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we will have another term which comes from nucleation, so the total will become 5 upon 2, yeah? But if nucleation is not necessary, that you're starting from a number of particles, then the exponent will be 3 upon 2. So by doing kinetic analysis, in principle, you can get information about what's happening. Now that information is not unambiguous. You know, there, there could be many things which give you the same exponent. Okay? It's not unambiguous. But it gives you a hint and then you can verify that by actually observing the system or doing something else. So from kinetic data, you could derive extremely valuable information about the growth rate, the nucleation rate, and you back that up by doing other measurements because the exponents are not unique. There are cases where you can get the same value of the time exponent for different mechanisms. If, uh, if, I, if I take curves like this as a function of temperature, then I can plot what's known as a time-temperature transformation diagram. So at a constant temperature, the curve is sigmoidal. In other words, if I plot the volume fraction versus time, it does that. Okay. So at any instant of time, I can find how much phase I have. If I plot this curve for zero volume fraction and for 100% transformation, in between at any temperature, I have a sigmoidal curve. If I do that at a whole variety of temperatures, I get this kind of behavior. That at high temperatures, the transformation is slow. Low temperatures, the transformation is also slow. And at an intermediate temperature, it's fast. Why is that? Why, first of all, is the transformation rate slow at high temperatures? Because there's not enough undergoing to have the main barrier. 
Very good. So the chemical free energy change is small at high temperatures because we are near the equilibrium temperature. Okay. Diffusion coefficient is high, but nevertheless the driving force for transformation is small, right? How about low temperatures? Why do we have the reaction slow? There's not enough thermal energy in the world to make Absolutely right. So any process which is thermally activated, whether it's nucleation or whether it's diffusion, will limit transformation rate at low temperatures. And in between somewhere you have some optimum combination. So this is called a time temperature transformation diagram because we've got time over here, the temperature, and here we have volume fraction. I could plot many of these to represent 10%, 20%, 30% transformation. And these diagrams are extremely useful when you're designing industrial processes for a whole variety of materials. And you can calculate them or you can measure them. So this is a time temperature transformation diagram. So we've done thermodynamics, phase diagrams. We did kinetic theory. We've combined everything now to give us an overall volume fraction of transformation. And this is isothermal transformation. That means we're looking at we supercool our parent phase to a particular temperature, hold it there. We expect transformation to start here and to finish at this time. So this represents isothermal transformation at a constant temperature. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so I think if you understood our Remy theory, that is a very major advance. And we'll continue with this in the next lecture to deal with slightly more complicated systems where you don't have just one phase growing, but you might have two different kinds of phases growing at the same time. Okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>